2023. Happy New Year to you all, if we haven't already said that enough times already. I am Professor Fiona Devine, and I am Head of Alliance Manchester Business School at the University of Manchester. Uh, and it does give me enormous pleasure to welcome you all to this evening's event. So both of you, of course, all of you who are all joining us here in person, but also to many of you, and I know there are many of you who are joining us this evening online. Um, so to bo both audiences, a a an extremely warm welcome. So we're incredibly pleased to welcome Dr. Catherine Elman, who's uh, an external member of the Monetary Policy Committee at the Bank of England to AMBS for tonight's lecture. She is an expert for the Productivity Commission at the National Institute of Economic and Social Research, and of course the Productivity Institute, which is home to within the business school. Catherine will be comparing the challenges facing the UK economy with the challenges facing monetary policy. Catherine's CV, which is amazing, <laughs> demonstrates her hugely significant accomplishments and contribution to the world of finance. We are very grateful to be hosting this important conversation here this evening. <coughs> now, Catherine joined the Monetary Policy Committee of the Bank of England in September 2021. She is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations and the American Amer Economic Association. And she was previously chair of the Economic Advisory Committee of the American Bankers Association. Prior to her Bank of England appointment, she was the global chief economist at Citibank from 2018, where she was responsible for thought leadership and the cross fertilization of research within the organization. Catherine's research addresses the relationships between financial markets and real economies with a focus on the nexus of globalization, inequality, and productivity. She has authored or co authored over seven books, more than 60 articles, and numerous shorter pieces and testimonies. Following Catherine's talk, there will be an opportunity for questions from the audience, and these are going to be facilitated. Please come in, make yourself comfortable. <laughs> going to be facilitated by Professor Philip McCann, who is a professor of urban and regional economics here at Alliance Manchester Business School. So for guests in the room, please raise your hand in a very traditional manner to ask a question. And for those of you who are joining us online, please put your questions in, into the chat function. Uh, and my colleague, Rasheen, at the back there will um, ask the question on your behalf. So we very much hope that there will be full participation of, of both audiences here uh, tonight. So without further ado, can I pass over to Catherine to begin tonight's lecture? Thank you very much, Catherine. Thank you very much for that uh, introduction, that kind introduction. And I'm really delighted to be here at Alliance Manchester. Um, let me just give you a little thumbnail about how I ended up here, um, because I think it gives you an idea of what uh, one, of, one of my roles uh, at in the Monetary Policy Committee at the Bank of England. Um, I am here because on Monday, um, I will be going to uh, Newcastle and to Durham to meet with uh, businesses, Chamber of Commerce, as well as citizens panels underneath the um, leadership of the agents, the so-called agents that are uh, throughout the UK uh, uh, economy. And the goal is for me to both communicate a little bit about you know, what, what monetary policy authorities are thinking about, but also to get information back on how businesses are responding to our, our, policy, uh, our policy moves and to understand uh, what citizens are thinking about in our policy moves. So once I, I knew that I was going to have that trip, I then said, well, you know, I know Bart is, we've known each other for a very long time um, in different hats and different organizations. I said, I know Bart's at Alliance Manchester. So let's go to Manchester. Um, and uh, he very much, uh, you know, uh, delighted in, to do the invitation. 
uh, to give this talk um, and to talk a little bit more um, offline with some various people here about productivity issues. Uh, so it's a it's a multi-purpose. And then of course I'm going to go to York in the middle and uh, I'll probably find a bar tomorrow, a pub, excuse me, a pub, a pub tomorrow to watch the Man City Manchester United game. I'm sure it'll be on someplace, right? <laughs> Um, so and then, so I'm going to make a little tourist thing and sort of independent assessment of the state of the northwest economies uh, over the course of the weekend. So it's a it's a great way to put put together a variety of different things. Uh, being here at an academic institution, I, I did um, uh, about ten years as a professor at Brandeis University, um, so I am familiar with the academic environment as well. Uh, so what I'm going to do in this talk is I'm gonna talk a little bit about productivity because essentially productivity is the essential ingredient to improving the state of well-being of citizens. That is the underpinning. Um, now, why, you know, how do I come to being talking about productivity? Uh, it's, uh, I was chief economist at the OECD in Paris for three years. And of course the OECD has, has a very long history of doing quite a bit of work on the productivity agenda, uh, increasingly using firm level data to understand the overall dynamics of productivity, not just the average uh, that we think about, but you know, underpinning that average, how do different kinds of firms react to different kinds of policies? So I start with talking about productivity. As I say, it's the essential ingredient to improving um, people's well-being. It's also an essential component of my decision-making uh, at uh, the Monetary Policy Committee. Um, I focus a lot on the demand side of the economy, and we'll talk about that. But ultimately, uh, productivity is not just about well-being of citizens, but it's also a very important ingredient in the set of issues and the set of data uh, that I need to be considering in the course of making my monetary policy decisions. So that's how we come together with something that is, is, is uh, 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 sort of uh, harder to understand sometimes productivity, longer term issues and so forth, uh, how we bring that together uh, for something that's very concrete, which is the decisions that I have to make uh, each time the Monetary Policy Committee meets. Um, I'll just add one last uh, point uh, because the structure of the Bank of England is a little bit different from where I come from, I can probably figure that out, it's the United States. Um, and uh, it's a, it's different from the Federal Reserve. I also worked at the Federal Reserve for 10 years early in my career, uh, starting with Paul Volcker and then under Alan Greenspan. Um, what's unique, two, two things unique about the Bank of England um, is this group of four of us who are so-called external members. Um, the other three members um, are British academics um, and I'm the outsider and there usually is one external member who's from someplace else. We each bring different insights into the policymaking arena, um, and that's a, a, a strength of the institution, but it's very different from most other central banks, uh, none of them having external members as far as I know. So it's a unique feature of, of the Bank of England. The second feature, which is not unique to the Bank of England, but is not common, among central banks is the transparency of our votes. Um, there's no mystery about how much I voted for uh, in terms of um, in, uh, changes in base, uh, basis points of the bank rate in the previous meeting. And there's really no mystery about why I voted for it either because I got, you know, we get our own paragraph. Uh, it's a group paragraph if there's more than one person who votes for a particular uh, uh, amount. There's a one paragraph for all the 50 basis points uh, folks in the last meeting, um, and uh, but I got to write my own paragraph because I voted for a 75. And we can talk about uh, a little bit more, and I will be telling you effectively why I voted for 75 at the last meeting, and actually 75 at the previous meeting, which was um, the, uh, the consensus at the time. So let's talk a little bit about these longer run factors underpinning um, productivity growth, what's going on in the UK in comparison to other economies. And then I'm gonna bring that into uh, why this is important and what are some of the issues most relevant now for monetary policy decision-making. Oh, yep, here we go. 
All right, so we're going to be talking about this productivity issue. So it's always important to think about what's the global context. It's it, you know how do we compare? What do we look like in comparison to other uh, other countries? Um, and so this is an example of some of the work that's been done uh, for here for the Productivity Institute, um, a paper quite recent that looks at um, where the UK is relative to two other sort of, we can compare the UK with lots of other countries, but in this case, the United States and to um, five members of the, of the European Union. Couple of things to take away from this presentation. The first one is, we, we very frequently make this distinction between manufacturing and services. Um, and I think it's particularly salient to show these two for the UK in comparison to the other uh, comparators here, the US and, and the EU, uh, EU5, because the dynamics and the relationships are really quite different. On the manufacturing uh, case, we can see that the, the UK is, uh, and the EU are both uh, really quite far away from the frontier uh, the UK is the productivity frontier, uh, the US is the productivity frontier, um, and we're quite far away from it, but so is Europe, okay? Um, and that has really opened up relatively recently. Um, on the services side, however, we've got basically the similar performance for the UK and the United States really arise in improvement uh, in productivity growth. Or, or the level of productivity, uh, dual factor productivity compared to the US, quite a different picture for the European uh, economies. So that's the first sort of observation. Uh, manufacturing, the behavior of that very different from services uh, for the UK economy in comparison. But there's another feature of this uh, uh, chart that I think is uh, at least as important to look at when we think about prospects going forward uh, for the global economy and for and for the um, the UK, and that is in both cases um, we have a frontier that has flattened out. That the that the rate of growth of uh, total factor productivity has basically flattened. That's not good news when we think about the underpinnings of the supply side of the economy. It's not good news when we think about the capacity of the economy in the long run to deliver those increases in economic well-being that ultimately we would like to see for our uh, uh, whoever is in our jurisdiction. Uh, so two things to take away. One is some good news uh, on the services side for the UK, uh, some concerns about uh, manufacturing, but overarching is concerns about the flattening out of total factor productivity growth in both in both the manufacturing and, and services. So we need to think about what might be the rash reasons behind that and what might be policies that can uh, improve prospects. We can talk more about uh, the frontier if you want to, um, but let me move on to talk a little bit more about UK specific um, uh, data. So we have these two different ways that we measure productivity. One is total factor productivity. That is after we strip out capital, after we strip out uh, labor contributions to economic uh, supply, the supply side of the economy. Um, total factor productivity, the word that I think is the best word to describe total factor productivity, because it's like, what is that? It's the transformation underpinning businesses. They have capital, they have labor. How do they put it together? And how does that trans that transformation in how they put it together, that is total factor productivity growth. And that's why when it starts to flatten out, we start to worry, where's the transformation? Where's the transformation? Where's the innovation? Um, labor productivity is marrying labor and capital together. Uh, so it abstracts from the, the pure innovation part. Um, but it's a, as I say, it's a marrying of the, of the labor and capital. Um, and you can see in both of these uh, charts, two different ways of measuring labor productivity, real output per hour and um, uh, labor productivity over on the right-hand side. In both cases, we have concerns facing the UK. Um, you can see in previous periods, uh, from a, with the start of a recession, there was a recession in the, you know, in the 90s, 
um, and the recession in the 70s, and total factor uh, uh, labor productivity or real output per hour improved during the course of the rebound following the recession. Uh, that hasn't happened uh, in the post uh, so-called uh, GFC, uh, global financial crisis phase. So we we kind of got stuck in terms of total uh, in terms of labor productivity uh, after the GFC. And another way of presenting the basically the same information, but it's a different way of presenting it, is this trend prior to the financial crisis, and then what has happened since. So in both cases, we end up with the revival of productivity after, uh, as we rebound from a recession, that hasn't happened. Uh, there are a lot of years here where we've been basically stagnant in terms of labor productivity. And that's, and, and how much loss in terms of potential uh, in the economy that comes from this type of presentation, you end up you know, looking at um, a much uh, poorer economy than would have been the case if we had been able to maintain that trend <clears throat> in labor productivity. So this is why it, it really matters to understand why we have this uh, slowdown uh, and really sluggish, uh, sluggish uh, situation. Um, so another way of thinking about um, where the problem, where the issues lie, where we, where we might want to start thinking about what policies could be put into place in order to, uh, to re revive the productivity. And all of these charts, I might add, these are all from the teams that I led uh, at uh, the OECD. So this is all OECD material. Um, we can give you your references if you if you want to know where they all come from. But uh, it's it's uh, it's that's, that's the source of the information. Um, so one of the things uh, that I've showed you in the previous diagrams, these are all averages, like what was happening on average over time uh, when one one country versus another country. That was in the first chart. Understanding what's down below the averages is critical to understand how to deploy policies in order to move the average. You want to know what's happening below. So we've got three, way we, to, the way we describe those um, underpinnings is we, we get individual firm level information. So it's, it's uh, companies that we can extract from company financial data and company, um, uh, the other data that's provided and um, extract what is a measure of transformation, multi-factor productivity or total factor productivity. And so we can put individual companies into a diagram. And so we're gonna get a distribution. Some countries, some companies in the, in the universe are really good at having transformation be central to their operations. And some companies are not so good. And so this is our, this is what a distribution looks like with the best performing companies are over here. They are the ones that have the highest um, uh, productivity um, as, as, as they say extracted from their financial data. And the ones over here are essentially more stagnant. They are not doing this transformation. That is this essential story for getting the uh, improvement in overall averages. So we've got some comparators here, France and Germany. And um, so the lower average we can see from here, and what, where do the other, where do all the companies get distributed? Uh, well, the UK in comparison to France and Germany, we can do <coughs> comparisons with other countries as well, which would be an interesting exercise. But there are a lot more companies uh, in the UK that fall kind of in the low end of the distribution. In other words, they're not undertaking the degree of transformation that is that would like lift the overall average, at least in comparison to these two other uh, two other examples. Um, even though what we saw in the first diagram was some challenges with regard to manufacturing, but looking pretty good on services. Well, you can see there's still also 
a low, a, a chunk of the corp company distribution that is in the low end of um, services as well. So when we think about averages and we think about policies to kind of improve the average, we can talk about, well, should we focus on did these companies, the ones who are already good, they're kind of the frontier companies, they're the ones that are undertaking a lot of investment, a lot of innovation, a lot of uh, uh, skill training and so forth. Um, should we moving, should we focus on those companies or should we be focusing on bringing up the bottom? These are two different approaches to changing the average. Um, and there are different policy choices and uh, there are different challenges, obviously, bringing up the uh, frontier, uh, pushing the frontier out more versus bringing up uh, the average at the bottom. Um, as I say, we talk a lot about different policy strategies uh, for frontier versus uh, the lower part of the distribution. Um, and it's, there's been, a, there's not a right answer here, by the way, either. Um, so we can talk about options. And opportunities. Um, so there's another way we can describe uh, this issue of there's the best, meaning the frontier, and the rest, meaning the ones that are kind of behind. Um, and that is we want to look at how this, this is a, a snapshot, this is one year snapshot. We can ask how has that, this snapshot of the distribution changed over time. Because you could say, well, this is Snapchat, doesn't look so great for the UK, but it's improving. So we're on the right track. Or you could look at the time series of this distribution, which is, this is a, a particular way of sort of taking the 90th this part of the distribution, that's the best. And then the 20th, that's not the best, that's <laughs> the tail. Um, and it takes a ratio. So we're looking at the best versus, you know, the top of the distribution versus kind of like a low, lower 20%. Um, and that's that ratio. And then we can track that over time. Um, and what we would like to see if our policy environment was improving, we would like to see this line at least flat or, or going down because you would get it getting closer together. Uh, you can see that basically the, the difference between the best and the rest for the UK is deteriorating. The best are getting better, or at least getting better than the lower half of the lower 20% of the distribution. And again, we've got some different comparators here. Again, we're looking at manufacturing and business services because they do be, they behave um, differently. Um, and you can uh, see that even for the services sector, again, the average is being pulled up because the best are getting better. Um, and, you know, you were comparing with a couple of other uh, uh, economies here, a couple of other countries who have a tighter distribution. You saw that in the previous snapshot, the tighter distribution, um, just to, you know, recall, tighter distribution, not so many superstars, not so many laggards in, the, uh, in France and Germany in comparison. Um, and so here's an example, again, France is in here, but a couple of other comparators uh, that again, for the UK, the gap, the, uh, the gap between the best and the, and the, and the worst is widening, uh, not narrowing. So once again, presenting us a challenge from the standpoint of policy in order to make some uh, decisions about, you know, exactly what is underneath this. This is now firm level data but we might want to look at these data by other cuts, by regions, for example. That's a very important uh, uh, a cut of these data. I don't have this here, but it certainly could be done. Um, so let's now, that was, a, that was a lot on productivity, probably more than you ever wanted to know, but I do think that it's important to kind of present this information in a number of different ways um, to kind of, it ascertained, uh, it's not just one, not just one thing that we presented and, and we told the whole story based on one presentation. This is, we're looking at lots of different ways of getting to the, to the level of concern that we have with regard to productivity growth. But that's not the only story. Um, other, we, there are two other big play pieces of the supply side of the economy 
Uh, and one of them is investment, and one of them, or the capital stock, and one of them is uh, labor. So um, the input to uh, the supply capacity of the economy, as I say, productivity a big component, but capital stock and investment um, another one. And this is not this is not a good news picture, right? It basically says that this is the investment in the UK significantly and has significantly been lower than um, the two other regions that I used as a comparison before. And that investment is not only a direct uh, concern with regard to the supply side of the economy, but we know that there's also important relationships between investment and innovation. In other words, those transformation numbers. So when we see weak investment and we see weak productivity growth, we should not be surprised about that relationship. Um, so another policy consideration is what is relevant here on the side of investment? What's holding it back? Um, what policies might be appropriate uh, to, to consider um, having it uh, boosted? Um, I put this chart in here because I think it's quite a puzzle. Again, this is OECD. Um, so it's it's coming from an organization that, that spends a lot of time looking at all sorts of different kinds of policies and evaluating policies for an economy against out uh, against performance. So evaluating <clears throat> policies in comparison to other countries, and then in comparison to performance, economic performance. These are the kinds of policies uh, or policies or observations about the state of uh, policy in an economy. Um, product market regulations is a, is a big category, um, but there's other public ownership, um, involvement in business operations, different kinds of regulatory things, um, burden on startups, barriers to services and networks, and trade and investment. So these are the kinds of, of characteristics of an economy that uh, at the OECD we pay quite a bit of attention to. So on this, um, you've got some comparisons of the UK relative to other countries. You know, you'll see averages, okay. UK looks pretty good, the most competition friendly countries. Um, you know, the UK looks pretty good on most of these metrics. Looks pretty good on most of these metrics, maybe not quite, as, as the competent, most competition friendly. Um, but for most of these metrics, the UK looks pretty good, which is why it is so puzzling when we then go over here, which is a shorter time series of the data that I was just showing you, although it's, it's also private investment. It's puzzling how a competition friendly environment, which appears to be the case when we look at the UK as a whole, is not delivering in terms of private investment. As I say, I'm not, I'm not gonna be able to answer that question here. Why is this? But I think it's a particularly interesting puzzle. It says it's not just the regulatory environment that matters for business investment. There are other factors that are going to be relevant when uh, a decision for business is, is we, do we invest or not in capital? Um, so it's it's enough, you know, it's, it's uh, necessary, but not sufficient. Uh, other factors that when we think about being relevant for uh, the supply side of the economy, and that is uh, where we are with regard to um, labor, uh, the labor component. And uh, I'm, I'm sort of... Uh, Keeping on this uh, theme here of uh, the, the UK, we would like to see the UK on that side of the diagram, not on this side of the diagram. And we would like to see where we are uh, post uh, in the last 10 years after, well, well, well after the uh, global financial crisis, uh, there's been a further deterioration. So it wasn't so great and it's worse. So uh, pretty much harping on that uh, theme. Um, and it matters, again, we come back to why do we care about the supply side of the economy in the longer run? It's because the econ economies have to deliver on 
what their citizens need or what their what their people need. And one of the things that is true in this economy is the rising share of uh, 65 plus in the uh, uh, population. There are demands, there are requirements that are needed that are different for older people than for younger people. Um, younger people are the ones who are presumably working. Older mm -hmm. people have worked uh, and they are now uh, still required. There are still things that they need that we need for them, uh, need to provide for them. And when the old age dependency ratio rises, we start to get concerned from two reasons. One is uh, fewer people available for work that are part of the supply side of the economy and greater demands on the economy to deliver benefits and what is needed in terms of healthcare, et cetera, pensions and whatnot. Um, and rising old age dependency is a challenge on both the supply and the demand side. So another element, this now kind of starts to bring us up to the present, another element of thinking about the supply side of the economy, labor and the contribution of labor to the supply side of the economy is where we are now, um, especially post pandemic, or uh, we're close to post pandemic, I hope. So there's, there's good news and less good news coming from these diagrams. So the percentage of the population who are participating in the labor market. The good news is that the UK has had a rising participation rate and is much higher than the Euro area, for example, uh, and recently, you know, uh, higher than the United States. So many people have been working, have been part of the supply side of the economy. And of course, people who are working are also on the demand side of the economy because they're getting earnings and they're, they're spending. Um, so that's kind of the good news that you can take away from, from this uh, diagram. The not good news, however, is the most recent behavior where labor force participation has fallen um, and, and is well below the pre-pandemic. Um, the US, this is true as well. But the Euro area, we're back and, and in fact a little bit above pre-pandemic. So again, this matters uh, when we think about the state of the economy you can, for two reasons. One is uh, if people are not participating in the labor force, then we have problems with um, uh, labor demand and, and then people aren't uh, choosing to work. So we end up with a mismatch between supply and demand for labor. Um, and the other thing of course, is that if, people are not participating in, in work, you start to ask the question, how does this fit in with their ability to consume? Are they taking, are they, they're not working, at least according to the data. Are they drawing on savings? Are they drawing on pensions? And how will that position these folks for, a 10-year horizon, five-year horizon. So you start to worry a little bit old age, uh, uh, old age dependency, instead of people who are not working, what are gonna be the demands on the working uh, group who are in work? What are gonna be the demands in the longer horizon uh, if people are not participating in the labor force? So who are they? Okay, we kind of know, we look at that. Um, and here is the decomposition. It's a very, it's a particularly, it's a short time series. We're only looking in the post-pandemic or the, the pandemic period, not post-pandemic, post in the pandemic period. Um, and there have been um, a lot more people retiring, uh, 65 plus. Okay. But this group, which I call older prime age, because they're prime age, and they're not working. Um, and this is a challenge. 
this is a challenge. Um, some uh, mm -hmm. some folks here are sick associated with COVID. Uh, there might be mismatches about what jobs are available because we know that there are a lot of vacancies out there. We talk to firms, they, they say, I, I'm really trying to hire. I can't seem to find anybody. So we know that there's a demand for labor. Uh, and these uh, charts are telling us kind of where the supply has exited the market. And, um, you know, retirement, you can figure, okay. Uh, but the, the 50 to 64 who are the prime age older workers, this is a challenging group. Um, and we can talk a lot about issues with regard to training. We can talk a lot about issues with regard to a flexible work environment. Um, but one of the things that we do know is that the longer people who are out of the labor market, especially in this age group, it's hard to get back. It's hard to get back. And 50 is young. I mean, I think it's young. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm in the orange category and I'm still working. So, um, and as I say, if you've retired and you have a portfolio and a pension, that's fine. But somebody who's not in the labor force at age 50, there's gonna be, you know, you've got 30 more years to go give or take a few, right, on average, who's going to finance that, I think is a really important intergenerational question. So um, there's another puzzle that we need to think about for uh, understanding the sort of the state of the economy. Uh, and I'm going to pivot now a little bit to start talking about the issues that are um, it's very salient uh, right now for monetary policy making, uh, and that is trying to understand the trade accounts. So um, we know from uh, looking at the data, so this is again we make these distinctions between goods and services in many different uh, domains. And here, what we're looking at here is, of course, the UK is a net importer of goods. Um, and particularly energy. Energy is in this uh, rapid increase in the uh, goods imports. On the other hand, the UK is a net services exporter. So we can kind of go back to that those different productivity dynamics that were in the very first or the second slide. We're a net exporter of services. Services had productivity growth that was right at the frontier with the US. So correlation between being globally competitive, being a net exporter, and having robust productivity growth. Uh, goods on the manufacturing side, um, not at the frontier, and uh, and not a and, and a net importer. I might add, this is these are this is not a super long time series. But this um, basic setup of the UK being a net exporter of services and a net importer of goods, this has been a feature of the UK economy for decades. So that is not, this is not a recent phenomenon. It even goes back to the time when in those first couple of charts, everybody was kind of had the same trajectory for goods, uh, good, goods total factor productivity. There is um, an important feature of the trade data uh, that I think is uh, something that we need to talk about. Um, and that is uh, mm -hmm. the changing relationship uh, with, uh, with Europe uh, that is particularly uh, dramatic on the uh, trade side. Um, there are other dimensions uh, as well, <coughs> but on the trade side, um, of course we have had the TCA, um, and one feature of, the, of that was to change uh, how data are um, put together for trade. Um, you can either take your own trade data or you can do something that we call mirroring. In other words, um, a good example here is uh, imports from the EU. We can measure them here on our side of the border or we can take the European Union uh, data. It, it's very, very common for statistical agencies to look at both of these data sources um, as a way of getting a handle on how much trade is really happening. 
um, and you take, but you get information from both sources. The point of this chart, again, goods um, exports, and uh, this is just the goods side of things, but we're now looking at different um, trading partners. Once we account for uh, the official data and the mirror data are really quite different. Um, it's something that is uh, not just represented here in, in the UK phenomenon, uh, UK environment. We see this uh, happening in the Chinese trade data. Uh, we see it happening in US data. Uh, US and Canada use mirroring data in order to uh, get a handle on how much trade there really is between the US and Canada. So it's, it's not uncommon at all to use the mirroring data. But once we use the, the data that mirrors, uh, the mirroring data, we start to observe um, much more of a gap, uh, a slowdown in the uh, uh, relationship with European Union on both the trade of goods uh, on, the tra on the import side, as well as on the export side. And so this is something that is an important uh, part of understanding the overall data for the UK economy. <clears throat> so let's now, having talked a lot about the supply side of the economy, having talked a lot about um, our concerns about productivity growth, about capital investment, about labor markets, the, those essential ingredients going into um, the supply side of the economy, and then you know, taking a little bit of a detour there and talking about data on trade, you know, it's a big deal, um, those different measures of, of trade data. Uh, they, we, we understand you know, the trade data get incorporated in GDP statistics. Uh, and so we need to really be thinking about um, these alternative measures of trade data as they get incorporated into GDP statistics. But now we're going to step back from those longer term uh, supply side issues and talk more about kind of the, the challenges that I face um, when I, I get into the, the room and uh, start to think about um, the policy decision making. I'll note that the supply side of the economy, of course, is a pretty big ingredient because ultimately, you know, inflation kind of comes with, you know, you look at demand and you look at supply and you know, if they match, then you don't have any problems with your price uh, prices. And when they don't match, then you do have problems with your prices. Um, and it's not just within an economy that you can have a demand and supply imbalance. That's not the only source of, of an inflation. Um, we have these shocks that come from the external environment as well. And so let's let's kind of put the UK into the global context and look at you know the the primary. The primary thing that I've been told to focus on, there is a remit it comes from the treasury and it is, my primary remit is uh, price level stability, which is defined as an inflation rate of 2%. Not my only remit, um, I also don't wanna to have too much volatility in GDP and there is an additional um, appreciation of climate in my remit. The principal one is uh, a 2% inflation objective. So. Where are we with with, it, with regard to that? Um, maybe I should do the kind of thing that I do with students. It's like, um, who knows what the inflation rate is? <laughs> so is it, in fact, we ask this question. So uh, is, it, is the uh, inflation rate in a sort of a two to four basket? Raise your hand. Okay. Is it in a sort of four to Six basket. Um, no, going to raise their hand. Okay. Um, okay. Is it a seven to nine basket? Oh wow. Okay. Uh, okay. Bart. Bart's going to go with with a seven to nine basket. Okay. So we're uh, way above uh, above nine, I guess. Nine, 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 uh, nine to eleven. Okay. We've got we've got a, maybe a uh, third. Okay. Um, above eleven. Okay, we got somebody up. Uh, okay, so we got we have about a uh, about a third of the class. Sorry, I'll call you my class. Uh, about a third of you kind of put in the nine to the eleven basket, uh, and that meant two thirds were not willing to tell me. 
<laughs> that either means you don't know, which is possible, or that um, you just didn't want to raise your hand. But uh, but this matters actually because if you don't know, that's an interesting problem that I face. For those who pick nine to eleven, well, at least I know what bucket you're in, and I can be thinking about that because expectations. Your expectations are incredibly important to my decision making. All right, so uh, here's my the sort of the backdrop to to my decision making. Um, the first one is kind of just like what's going on in the economy. Um, I already did a lot on the supply side, so now we're going to look at the, kind of the demand side and and where we are with regard to uh, our comparators. So. Um, the first uh, observation I think we have to have in our in our context in our back pocket is where we are in comparison to uh, what the trend was uh, pre-COVID, um, and uh, where we are is here's you know you know you can well, we all know what happened in COVID. Okay, so everybody locked down, and so that's why those you know those big spikes are there. But what's really um, uh, of a significant concern is we have not recovered uh, to the pre-COVID trend. I mean, that's obvious, but uh, that's well known, but but we're not even back to where we were uh, barely to uh, when COVID started. So we have, in a sense, lost a lot of demand relative to what was likely to be the case or we thought might be the case prior to the COVID period. The United States, uh, pretty close to their pre-COVID trend. And the Euro area, not quite there. But so in comparison to the US and the Euro area, the UK really does stand out in not having gotten back anywhere near the pre-COVID trend. And we can see that in terms of this uh, employment chart is very similar to the one that we've already looked at in terms of labor force participation. <laughs> All right, prices, including um, our forecast from the November monetary policy report. Uh, and a couple things going on with prices, two things in fact, uh, that we wanna take away from this chart. So here's our, this is the data. Okay, so we started to see this really significant rise in prices. That's kind of where you're getting your nine to 11 coming from. But, and over here is the inflation rate, price level, inflation rate. So the other thing to take away from this chart is um, in our projections, we do see the prospects for the inflation rate to come down. Once the price level stabilizes, then that is where inflation starts to decelerate. The price level stabilizes, inflation rate, which is the delta of the price level, starts to decelerate. And that's in our forecast. However, you're gonna still be poorer, right? Because this part doesn't go away. So that's when we think of, when we talk about, there's a terms of trade shock, energy prices are higher, food prices have gone up. Though, and those are not, those are external shocks. That's gonna make you poorer. And there's not, monetary policy cannot address an external shock like that. And when we had the initial uh, pandemic, um, the, in the initial sort of re, uh, situation with the pandemic prices rising uh, and then energy prices rising. For a while there, we did talk about this being transitory because we thought that we would end up with uh, energy prices coming down and, and uh, all of the goods prices, global goods prices coming down. But we still ended up with, in the end, because the price level has gone up, there is still essentially uh, household incomes being lower in real terms. So let's look at kind of where that price level shock actually starts to emerge in the inflation rate. So here's our, this is a standard decomposition. Um, so here's our 
this is how the energy price shock started to be revealed in inflation. Um, this is where sort of goods, global goods prices, we are importing goods that uh, US demanded was a lot, of, wanted a lot of goods and China wasn't producing quite as much as they used to and the shipping in the middle was uh, expensive. Uh, and so we ended up with the goods that we imported being more expensive because of all these things that were happening in the external environment. So in some sense, all of this, all of this represents sort of externally generated increases in inflation. And again, monetary policy really can't change supply chain while it's stuck. It can't really react to what's happening in the US uh, economy. Um, so those things are not something we can really react to. However, then we start to look at the things that are sort of underneath the umbrella of the monetary policy authority. And that is things that are basically domestic. 43% of the, of the basket services used to be running at about a 1%. Uh, and, and you can see here that it's now quite a bit higher. So we start to talk about how these external shocks start to become embedded into uh, pricing by firms due to up, up, you know, cost, of, uh, cost pressures uh, increasing on them and they're passing it through to higher prices and start to get in what's embedded in wage demands partly um, because of reactions to overall inflation, but also importantly because of that labor supply, labor demand uh, disequilibrium. So uh, moving just onto a couple of other uh, charts before we can move to questions. Disentangling what's going on with this external stuff that I cannot really do anything about, but this embedded stuff which is my responsibility to try to counteract. We try to disentangle these in a couple of different econometric ways. Um, and uh, these are these I'm presenting two different ways uh, in this underlying inflation measure, which is one econometric technique, and average inflation in the lowest volatility quintile of the basket is a completely different econometric technique. Uh, and then you can see headline inflation, which is, for those of you who are in the nine to 11 basket, yeah, you, you, were, you were doing pretty good. That's where the headline inflation is. But the underlying inflation, the ones that, that kind of is supposed to be cruising along at 2%, well, not so much. That's what we're worrying about, that the underlying inflation dynamic, which is something that is my responsibility to address, that underlying inflation dynamic looks pretty robust right now. And that's our, our job is to bring that back to 2%. Um, we ask a lot of questions because it's not just what's happening in the day to day, which is that chart I just showed you, but we're asking questions. What do you think is going to be inflation next year or three years from now? Because if you all of a sudden start to say, I think it's going to be like, I don't know, three or 4% inflation rate in a couple of years. And if businesses start to sort of say, yeah, I think it's going to be high. And I think I can raise my prices by about that much. We start to end up having an internal dynamic that keeps that uh, underlying inflation measures higher than our 2% objective. So we ask, what do you think? Where do you think inflation is going in the medium term? And so a couple of different ways we ask this. We have something called the decision maker panel, which is firms. And there's also the inflation attitude survey, which is asking households. So both of these are um, uh, presented here. Uh, the decision maker panel is uh, asking, what do you think consumer price inflation, the CPI inflation is going to be in three years? And it's pretty much sitting at 4%. So firms looking are looking three years ahead are saying, I think CPI is going to be 4% in three years. That's not 2%, that's 4%. Um, then we ask uh, households, what do you think inflation is going to be? 
And it's important, again, to get back down to this distribution uh, issue. And that is, if you just look at the average household, they're saying, oh, about three and a half percent. But if you actually look at what the buckets are, which is that chart over there, you're looking at households and firms both looking at inflation two to three years ahead. It's at four percent, not my two percent objective, but four percent. Um, and this is the decomposition. Here are all these new buckets, right? Um, and looking at the most recent, um, the most recent indicator for 22 Q4. You have a, a pretty sizable share of the households um, in attitude survey that not only think it's going to be high, but an increasing number, an increasing number of people are putting themselves in the high inflation buckets. And that's what the difference is between, that's how we get at the differences between the average and, and the um, uh, and the distribution. So I only have like Two more charts, so just stick with me, okay? Um, and of course, those things are very important ingredients. I think I'll skip this one. Um, so I am going to talk through this one because this is what the financial markets think is what's going to happen uh, to interest rates over the medium term. And there are two, uh, we've got some comparators here, and then we've got two different two different time periods that we're, we're kind of showing you here. Um, one time period, which is the um, the dashed line, this is this is yesterday when my my team put this together. So for the UK, for the UK, the market is expecting me to do this prior to the November uh, MPC meeting. So it was October twenty sixth, I believe. It's uh, in the October. This is what the market thought. I was going to do. So if you were, I'm not going to ask, I'm not going to quiz you. Did you listen to Andrew Bailey's uh, presentation? Uh, did you read the minutes? I'm not going to ask you that, obviously. But we talked about in November after our monetary policy meeting, we talked uh, there in the minutes about there were two things that we wanted to communicate. The first one was that we thought interest rates, uh, the bank rate would still need to be rising more from November, that was the first piece of the communication. Um, but we also said at the time that we thought that the market's curve, the future of what the market was saying that we they thought we were going to be doing, that it was too aggressive. And so what you see the market has, there were lots of different factors that have now been relevant for the market's uh, metrics, um, but indeed, the uh, market believes that we will continue to have to raise interest rates in part because firms and households both think that inflation is going to be at four ish in the near, you know, in the medium term. But also that it's going to, that we also, it, our, our communications was effective in bringing the market curve down. Um, the, interesting additional aspect of this particular diagram uh, comparing different um, market expectations for what the various central banks, what they think the central banks are going to do is the Federal Reserve is going to have to hike more, but it's going to reverse a whole lot. Uh, the euro area is actually also looks have a pretty significant reversal. Uh, the market's expectation for us at the Central uh, Bank of England does not have as much of a reversal. It has an elevated, uh, elevated interest rate, bank rate, for an extended period of time. It's an interesting uh, commentary from the market about what they think we're going to do. I'm going to skip these and take us to the sort of my, my uh, economics lesson for the day. Um, what I've told you about, about the expectations, I've given you different examples of expectations and how that those expectations remaining elevated are important. I've given you examples of these underlying trend in, in the data and how though that underlying trend 
is uh, running at 6%. The expectations at four, underlying trend at six. And I've given you, um, starting out saying there's a lot of external, there's a lot of external shocks that I can't control, having to do with energy, having to do with food, uh, having to do with global goods prices. So there's stuff I can't control, but there's stuff I am responsible to control. Um, how do I think about that in the context of what I still do have as a dual mandate? It's not as dual as the Federal Reserve, but I still have both an inflation uh, remit as well as this one to try to not have too much volatility in output. So this is a way of presenting that relationship between the inflation objective, 2% at the start, and not too much volatility in output. So it's live star. So the way we think about this is if you have really tight markets, in other words, a lot of uh, demand for stuff and not a lot of supply, you end up with inflation rising. If you are in a position of a lot of slack, so there's not so much demand out there, easy to produce stuff, uh, well, inflation comes down. Okay, so that's so-called Phillips curve. Where does expectations come in? And, and why do we focus on them so much? Um, you can each each Phillips curve is drawn for particular inflation expectations. Okay? This one is drawn when inflation expectations actually are rated two. But if I think that inflation expectations might be drifting, which my evidence kind of says it might be drifting then we get a different Phillips curve. And now we have a challenge because if this is the new Phillips curve that has drifted, I am I'm challenged as a policymaker to, if I, if I want to get back to two, I have to really, really uh, have a significant recession. Uh, because I have to get back, I have to get the expectations down. Or, of course, the other alternative is, is that I give up on my 2% objective. So the amount of drift in expectations is a way of gauging how challenging it is for us to make the adjustments in the economy to get to our 2% objective at a no no uh, no recession situation. Getting expectations back under control, keeping them under control, is essential to avoiding this. We want to avoid this. So when some people say in our in our um, you know commentary and so forth, when people say it's important for me to have higher bank rate now to avoid having it be higher and later, and it will be worse later. This is what they're talking about. We do not want to have any drift in inflation expectations because it is much harder than for us to use the bank rate tool to get us back to our 2%. <clears throat> Um, so this is kind of where we ended up uh, after in December. Um, the committee collectively uh, increased, or uh, the consensus of the committee was that it was appropriate to raise the bank rate by uh, 50 basis points to three and a half percent to try to gauge, uh, keep those inflation expectations under control. It says it might additional might be required because of some concern with regard to various tightness in labor and product markets. In other words, wages rising and prices rising right now. Um, so we might have to do some more. Um, nobody likes to have higher interest rates, but nobody likes to have double digit inflation either. Right, so we, we don't wanna have double digit inflation any longer. So part of that, part of the story about how to reduce that inflation rate comes from raising bank rate. Um, we will act forcefully, make the minutes, that's the word we use. 
Um, I think these are very important uncertainties. This is, this is stuff that is a key ingredient to our, our forecast, and that is um, those external prices stabilizing. I showed you the picture of the price level increasing and then stabilizing. That was a forecast. We're not sure yet about whether that's going to materialize. On the other hand, they could start to could start to decelerate even faster, as in fact energy prices have. Um, financial market expectations. Well, I did see show you that financial markets expectations from the uh, November meeting to the present actually had moderated in terms of how high the market thought we were going to take the bank rate. Um, will consumers smooth more than projected? Are they going to continue to consume or are they going to save a lot? It's a very important question, especially in the context of the energy price guarantee. Um, how is that going to change uh, consumer behavior? Um, importance policy spillovers. We're not the only central bank. Uh, the UK economy is part of the global economy and financial, uh, plenty of cross border financial flows. Um, and what's happening by other central banks is an important ingredient in terms of the policy spill, uh, in terms of economic spillovers, the UK, but also policy reactions. Um, and then this last one, which is to me kind of a critical question, is will medium term inflation expectations drift back down to 2%? So, what I hope that I've done here is to kind of coordinate this longer term question about productivity growth, put it into the context of the supply side of the economy, make the bridge between what's happening is particularly in the labor market, but also investment, make that bridge to what's happening in the uh, inflation outlook today uh, with a particular focus on uh, the inflation uh, expectations, but also what we can control or what we need to control on the domestic side versus the things that are going to make us poorer because energy prices are going to be higher at the end of the day. Uh, and that's not something we can control, at least uh, under the current uh, configuration of the next couple of years. So thank you very much. Um, I really look forward to um, some more questions and discussion. Minutes? Yeah. 20 minutes. About 20 minutes. Okay. Well, thank you. Five minutes. Five minutes. Five minutes. Five minutes. Five minutes. Five minutes. We've got about 20 minutes. No, we're going to do 20 minutes. We're going to do 20 minutes. Any questions? I'm here. Sure. So, I mean, firstly, thank you, Catherine. It's fantastic. And obviously, those of you who had a look at Catherine's CV, it's completely astonishing. At the same time, I think also it gives us you know, a, a chance to, to get a sense from your vantage point about the issues in the UK. So, obviously, you, you come through the American system, but you work in global businesses, chief economist at OECD, and so on. Just coming to the UK and, and the kind of challenges and puzzles that you're portraying, just, just since you've taken on these roles and also the different vantage points you're playing, do you find that aspects of the UK really puzzling? Do you find the UK an odd economy in some ways? I mean, there are many economists who, on some level, think the UK looks quite typical, but then there's others that you know, just doesn't fit any textbook type of framework at all. Do you have a sense of this? Are we any different to the extent to which other countries are different or, or not particularly? Well, from, from my OECD experience, you know, I, I think there's uh, uh, the advantage of, of being in an organization like that is uh, every country is different in its own way, but when you put them all together into a, a, a sample, you start to sort of see um, comparisons, uh, relationships, and so I would I would not put the UK as an outlier at all. I think it is it's within the it's within the set. So, going back to one of the slides you showed me, the difference in terms of levels of investment in the right. UK. 
Yeah. Now there are efforts to try and mm -hmm. you know reassess that Jonathan Haskell's work, for example, different yeah. measures of intangibles. Yeah. But of course, you'd have to do a similar exercise with all the other countries mm -hmm. where intangibles are calculated in different ways depending on the tax treatment and yeah. so on. So it's not simply to say, well, we can narrow the gap by yeah. re-estimating just in the UK. But this puzzle of the low investment rates, one of the areas we have in the Productivity Institute, one of the big themes is this question of is the UK short term? Is in terms of financial behavior relative to other countries, which is something you often see in the media. Yeah. The difficulty is when you look at actual interest rates, the UK more or less mir mirrors everywhere else, whether it's corporate rates or whatever. Mm -hmm. So why would this be the case? So one way of thinking about, I don't know to what extent it might, it might be useful, is, is Ben Bernanke's Nobel Prize lecture recently. He talked about the, the external financial premium mm -hmm which is the gap between the real overall cost of finance and the risk-free rates. And that potentially includes many, many things that don't appear in a standard spreadsheet type of way of thinking. Do you think that might be a useful way of thinking about things in the UK case? For many uh, economies, the cost of capital facing business is very different from the policy rate. Uh, so this gap um, that you're talking about is not unique at all to the UK. Um, I think that uh, one of the things that uh, came out of the research uh, at, at the OECD was the extent to which businesses uh, focused on uh, internal markets versus global markets when they were considering an investment strategy. Um, and the greater was the importance and the focus on the global markets, uh, the more likely the firms would be uh, undertaking an investment uh, <clears throat> program. And you know this, this in some sense is not unrealistic given that uh, if you're a smaller economy, domestic demand is, is not gonna give you the scale that you need. And this isn't true for every business, obviously. Some don't need scale. But some of them do, and so you really need to be uh, thinking outward uh, beyond the uh, beyond the border uh, when thinking about the uh, investment strategy. Well, I, I'm sure we've got questions. I can see hands going up already. So, okay, going up very quickly. So, what, what I would suggest is we take some questions from the room, and then we have more than 200 people online, mm -hmm. um, two or 300 people, we're not sure exactly how many. Mm -hmm. So I think we'll, we'll take a few internally and then a few from the external uh, observers. So I think we'll go one, two, three, four. Should we, should we start off in this, this order, just in terms of the hands going up? So if you could say who you are as well, that would be very helpful. Hi, my name is Ben Bullo. I'm a retired person who works in financial services all my life. And thank you, really interesting presentation. And there's a lot of parameters involved, slides that you showed us in terms of uh, for things that can impact on the economy, and a lot of interrelationships between those. Which of those, as I say, keeps you awake most at night? Hopefully, you don't keep you awake at night. <laughs> but in terms of what are you worried about most in terms of some of those fragmented? To, you know, just to get us back on track. Yeah. Are we going to collect that? <coughs> yeah, yeah, I think it's actually a good Paul, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 it seems to me that the key thing at the moment is private sector pay settlements. Because if we have a product, an economy where productivity growth is effectively zero and private sector earnings are running at seven or eight percent, then I would say the Bank of England, unless you bring about a, a really major recession and put interest rates up to like 8%, it's bound to miss the target. Um, and it's a question of to, to what extent they get locked in. Mm -hmm. so even if world energy prices fall and private sector earnings are only 7 8%, then we're going to get inflation for five at least. So um, I think there might be signs that are starting to moderate the pace of the But that seems to me to be the key factor to judge over the next few months. Um, my name is uh, Andy Bruce, I'm a Reuters reporter. Um, I, uh, I just wondered if, uh, just on what maybe some of your colleagues are thinking on the other end of the MPC, um, about do you think there's any risk of over-tightening? And also, 
to ask if uh, you'll be supporting City or United. <laughs> <laughs> That's a, that really moves the opposition. Over time, Project the Institute. Um, I'd like you to link the first part of your presentation with the second. And my specific question is how much would productivity growth have to raise what it is today to make you less concerned about the drift of the flip curve mm -hmm. and allow you to drop, let interest rates go down faster? All right. Um, okay. Tough, tough questions. Um, oh, so we're going to add one more to the last question. We'll come back to you in a moment. Okay. Okay. Right. Take these four questions. Okay. So, the key variables to keep your yeah. wage, yeah. wage settlements, the risk of over tightening, yeah. and how much do we have to shift the dial to the Um, so you know what, what keeps me up at night from the standpoint of my uh, direct responsibilities is inflation expectations. Okay. Um, because to me, a drifting of inflation expectations is something that if uh as I say, it makes a trade-off between inflation and recession much more challenging. So that's what keeps me up at night from the uh, near term. But uh, there's there's no question that this combination of of uh, prime age, older prime age workers leaving the labor force, and I don't know who's going to pay for their pensions and health care. The younger people are not there aren't enough of them, and they're not getting enough wages, real wages. So uh, that's a problem, um, and I'm, I get very concerned about the um, investment. And uh, if I think we, if we got either uh, the combination of those two in a better in a better state, then the productivity growth would come along. So that's that's my answer to you on that. Um, on the on the private sector wage settlements, um, frankly, uh, my view is that what generates inflation in an economy is the ability of companies to raise their prices, their pricing power. And um, so I focus much more on pricing power of firms and where it comes from and what might moderate it uh, than on what's happening in the labor market. Because there are many costs uh, facing firms these days uh, and labor is one, but it is not the only one. So ultimately inflation is generated out of consistent, the capability of firms to raise their prices. So that's what I focus on. Um, in terms of the uh, uh, over tightening question, well, I, you know, I'm, I'm not going to speak for the other people, the member, members on the committee. Um, they have their paragraph in the minutes too. Uh, so um, I don't. So the over tightening question is ultimately about the question of how the pace and the completeness of the uh, interest rate, uh, bank rate increases to date pass through to change uh, behavior of price setting. And they have to pass through the financial markets first before they even get to the real economy. Um, and so we can get a gauge the over tightening question um, by uh, what financial markets are telling us that they're not all all they're not omnipotent. Um, you know, I worked there for three years. They're definitely not um, omnipotent. They all, don't always get it right. We have two different measures of um, uh, financial market uh, expectations of what they think we're going to do. One of them is the one I uh, presented there. It's the market move, market uh, curve. The other one is a survey that we do. It's it's available um, online. They are different. And we look at both of them as a as a gauge for uh, what is uh, where we are with regard to how much tightening. We also have um, monetary and financial conditions indexes, which are a metric that evaluates um, how the bank rate translates into, for example, lending rates and mortgage rates and equity valuations and the currency. So we have a lot of different ways of looking at it. My reading is we're not there yet. So questions, we have a question. Oh, yeah. Bart's question is, oh, yeah, sorry, Bart, sorry, Bart is, Bart's question is, is right on the money, but it is way too hard. <laughs> I'm asking. I know, I know. Let, let me let me get my pencil and paper out and I'll, I'll get back to you on that one. Yes. So we have a question here. Do we have any other questions in the audience before we go online? 
Uh, okay, we'll take one, two, three in that order. So yourself, sir. Uh, let us ask you whether you've looked at the composition of the industrial or the, the economical base. Mm -hmm. And the reason I asked that question is because we, we sorry, Sammy and Amiri, by the way, I'd be invested on the performing industrial companies in the UK and Europe. And every time I've tried to uh, gauge the productivity and efficiency of a German company compared to the UK, if they are similar businesses, there isn't a lot between them. What there is though, is that there are a lot more medium-sized businesses in Germany compared to the UK. And they tend to stay owner managed yeah. for a much longer period. And they tend to have far less what I call uh, low added value type uh, businesses like coffee shops, restaurants, hairdressers, and, and you know things of that nature. And that, even though it's not a big population, every time I've tried with the CBI to look at this, this uh, productivity issue, it's almost to do with the fact that we have the composition base of the UK economic base. It consists of too many little one or two, two people uh, companies who by definition have to be not very efficient. It's composed of too many low, lower added value businesses. And that the best businesses in the UK are purchased by private equity. In other words, UK businessmen sell too quickly before it, it peaks. And that doesn't happen in Germany, France, Italy, Spain. So one is to do with the structure and also the acquisition the ownership. Yeah. Yeah. Two questions there. Yeah. Yes, sir. So that's a major question. Um, the, the zero rate, the blink, the rates when they are almost zero, mm -hmm. the base rate being almost zero point two five percent or whatever. Mm -hmm. How much is that to blame? How to bring that back into order with very high interest rates? And mm -hmm. the second thing is post pandemic, people are thinking of their lives being shorter. Mm -hmm. So who wins if the consumer continues spending? Can the bank re the banking and really control with inflation? So with the interest rates rising, who wins, the consumer or the bank winner? If they continue spending. And yourself, sir. Uh, my question relates uh, to the work workforce situation. Um, I'm 72 and work. Uh, my company would want me not to work because they rely on me. But the issue that uh, I see these addressing is that twofold in this economy is that during COVID, a lot of people took the opportunity to retire early, which is right. But the, the second one is that people to go back into, uh, into work is benefits in that there's these two-pronged situation is that there's too much disincentive for somebody to go back to work. I mean, I do it because I enjoy it. And a lot of people potentially could go back. So what, what's your opinion on how the Britain should address this issue? Um, okay, so um, on the, on the um, uh, size composition and uh, other composition elements, uh, this is something that, again, the OECD looks at in quite a bit of depth uh, because it's using the firm level databases. So it can be evaluated. Uh, the distributions that I showed you um, basically were describing uh, at least the small unproductive firms yeah. being particularly present uh, apparently in the UK uh, universe, of, uh, at least in comparison to those two countries that were on that chart, France and Germany. Um, the next question should, you know, you, you emphasize that uh, the sort of the good ones got purchased by private equity. Well, that's that's an interest, that's, that's there's certainly examples of that. Um, what should be the policies to keep them from doing that? I think is an if that's a different, you know, that's a that's a different and challenging question. Might be interesting to do some comparisons with the German model, with, for example, um, Sweden, where where they have a different kind of uh, strategy for uh, keeping um, small firms, sort of uh, with medium-sized firms, uh, uh, kind of operational in the economy under under private, uh, not private equity ownership, but, but under private ownership. So that's a that's you know kind of a, a way to think about that. Um, so uh, again, I none of those are my policies, right? Uh, they they're not in not in my my portfolio, but they're certainly policies that are important to consider 
when thinking about the productivity puzzle. Um, and you know, as I say, there's a lot of there's uh, a range of topics that we can talk about again from the from the OECD uh, back backdrop. Um, on the um, uh, is the low interest rates for low for long is the sort of the co uh, cause of where we are now. Um, you know, I my view is that those low interest rates were appropriate for that time. Um, when I, I started um, at, at the uh, Bank of England in September of um, 2021, uh, and frankly, I, I did vote to end uh, QE early. I, I, I thought it was done, we, we, and we, I didn't think that it was no longer it was no longer necessary. So I voted to end it early. That was one of my first votes. Um, so, uh, but but to sort of to sort of say this situation we have right now is a consequence of the, of, of the QE. You know, when you look at that decomposition, uh, how much inflation was being generated by the oil price shock, how much inflation was being generated by the goods price shock, those those are not related to Bank of England quantitative easing and, and extended period of time at, at 25 basis points. So uh, there would be internal dynamic, um, which is the, uh, the embeddedness, uh, embeddedness of in, inflation in the domestic um, that is a consequence of those external shocks becoming embedded. That's, that's why we use that, that word. Um, and that's not to do with what happened uh, in, in QE. Um, with regard to consumers, um, you know, this, ultimate, this is the question. I mean, uh, consumers continuing to be robust in their spending is something that I pay a lot of attention to. Uh, there was a chart there, which would have taken way too long to explain, but there is this question. Um, there have been a number of policies put into place to moderate uh, the extent to which the energy price shock has affected uh, households' income. Appropriate policies you know, put into place, but they do mean that people are spending less on energy than they otherwise would. That can be translated into perhaps savings or perhaps consumption. And we are looking pretty carefully across income deciles for how those programs that are part of the um, fiscal package, how those can translate into uh, demand conditions different from what would have been the case without those policies in place. But it's a, it is very much a question of savings versus spending. Um, and, 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 and on your, your question about, about uh, you know, going back to work, again, I'm not, uh, I, I uh, uh, don't know uh, about the benefits cliff. That's, it's a common problem in many countries. Again, the OECD spends a lot of time looking at what are the barriers to go back to work. If it is a tax barrier, if it is a, you can only work so many hours before your marginal tax rate is 100%. Um, those are disincentives. And in some countries, um, there has been quite a bit more attention being paid to those kinds of barriers that maybe we didn't pay attention to them before, but they are particularly salient now in those economies where labor force participation has, um, has, has declined. So can we take a... So two or three questions from the online audience. Absolutely. Um, so Maureen Khan asks, um, in light of being passed on earlier this week that the Federal Reserve will not be going to plan the point in the UK, what are your views on whether monetary policy in the UK should take plan of the point to account? Uh, well, that's an easy one to answer because I was at the <laughs> Economics Association meeting um, in uh, New Orleans last Saturday, uh, explicitly doing a uh, a presentation on uh, the relationship between climate policy and monetary policy. Um, <clears throat> and sort of the uh, conclusion uh, from that is that uh, different, of course, climate policy, it's not just our own, right? This is a, this is a global, uh, global challenge. Monetary policy authorities in, in or, or regulatory authorities are taking different approaches some are more like on the carbon tax side. Some are more on the uh, cap and trade side. Uh, in all cases, there are lots of complexities. 
Um, but uh, one of the things that comes out of the research, this is new research at the Bank of England, um, is that uh, these different policies and how the policy spillovers, these are regulatory policies and ca carbon related policies, uh, how they have uh, different implications for the volatility in inflation, volatility in prices. And volatility in prices is one of the ingredients that go into inflation expectations. So for me, this new research that looks at the nexus between climate policies in the global context and monetary policy at home, so you've got global, climate, home, monetary, the nexus there uh, is uh, importantly on the degree to which there is volatility, the di distribution of price outcomes. So I think it's, you don't have to be a climate bank you don't have to have climate in your remit to still care a whole lot about the implications of climate policy for the thing that is in your remit. Um, and then, of course, we can talk about uh, financial stability and, and, and so forth. That's, that's not my job, I'm, although I think it's kind of related. Um, so uh, lots of there's, as again, you don't have to have climate in your remit, which we do. Uh, to still care uh, about how climate is, uh, how climate policy is undertaken. Um, and finally, Evan Sandy asked, um, does the UK's inflation lead or do I have a case contribute and what the historic pattern of doing this in the rest of Europe and the US? Uh, I'm sorry. So does the UK inflation patterns, do they lead or lag other countries with respect to either the US or the rest of Europe? And what's the patterns being distorted? Uh, um, the, the clearest relationship um, that is relevant here is the one where um, there are interest rate differentials between countries both from a policy perspective, but also for the underlying uh, <coughs> under, underpinnings of, of uh, interest rate differentials, those translate into an appreciation or a depreciation of sterling. And so an appreciation tends to moderate um, inflation in the UK, a depreciation of sterling tends to be supportive or to, to buoy up inflation in the UK. So. It, it's not, uh, and then there are other factors, of course, that move exchange rates as well. So I like to think of, of um, not a leading lagging relationship, but more an integrated relationship between uh, foreign uh, the policies that uh, emanate from abroad. What are their implications for the UK? M more, uh, you know, if we think about it, um, there are more because the UK is an open economy and a, and a small economy when we think about it in terms of global capital flows. Um, there are a lot of external drivers that affect domestic policy making. And I think I gave you two examples today in terms of the global goods prices and the energy prices. Okay, well, thank you very much, Catherine. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you very much. So, um, first of all, Catherine, thank you for coming up to Manchester and visiting AIM, the Alliance Manchester Business School and the Product Exchange. So it's great to, to have you here and hear your talk. Thank you to the audience for staying on a bit. I think it was worth your time. I hope it was. Uh, so we thought we would add 15 minutes to it. Uh, so that's great as well. Thanks, Fiona, for your interrupting comments and Philip for moderating it and the events team for making this all possible today. So early in the new year, with such a big out turn, it's fantastic. And then finally, I have the honor to advertise the next Vital Topic Lecture, and that will be held on Thursday, 9 February, when we'll be joined by an AMDS MBA alumnus, Sean Merritt, who's currently Chief Business and Commercial Officer at Bayern and Tech in Germany. And he will discuss his key role at the helm of that biotechnology company, as you all know, was the first to approve uh, an mRNA based COVID 19 vaccine. So that will be a very different discussion than today, but I'm equally exciting. So we're looking forward to see you all. Thank you for coming. Enjoy your evening. And see you. Yeah.